Are you ready to unleash your full potential and become unstoppable in your success and leadership? Welcome to the Unleashed and Unstoppable podcast, where we provide powerful insights and strategies for coaches, corporate leaders, and entrepreneurs. I'm Alexanne Carter. And I'm Carol Register, and we're certified master neuro coaches who are passionate about helping you overcome your limiting beliefs and optimize your performance. Each week, we'll be sharing actionable tips and strategies using neuroscience, from interviews with industry experts to solo episodes to help you live a life of power, purpose, and possibility on your own terms. Join our community of like-minded individuals. Hit subscribe now, and let's be unleashed and unstoppable together. Hey, hey, powerful leader. Welcome, welcome back. I am so excited to have with us today a great, great friend of mine, Barbara, who is here to have a great discussion around being neurodivergent. So around neurodiversity and leadership and performance so that you truly can reach that optimal level of performance, even if you are someone who is very gifted. And I love using the word gifted with neurodiversity. So maybe it's you, maybe it's those that you lead, maybe it's even your kids. We really want to unpack some of the stigma around being neurodivergent and really help you thrive and empower you to take control of this gift that you have been given and really be able to use it to create the impact that you get to create in this world. So Barbara, welcome, welcome. Could you just dive in and give us a little bit of, you know, about who you are, a bit of your background, and then we can dive into this really juicy topic. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Alex, for inviting me. Um, I may slip for your for your viewers. I may call you Ali. That's okay. And- <laughs> no worries <laughs> no, at all. Before that, right? But I'm Barbara. I'm Barbara Harrington, and I am a chemist by training. Um, over 35 years of experience in chemistry. And I turned business coach, oh, probably about, well, if I'm honest, in the 90s, I was already coaching people in industry. <laughs> so that's a little while. <laughs> but, 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 but really, the kind of coaching that Alex and I do, that's really in the last several years. But I've been coaching for quite a long time. Um, I have many awards. I, I, I call myself a, a, a woman in STEM. Um, I have a beautiful award from Vex Robotics. So that's a very coveted award uh, from Vex. It's where um, I inspired our next generation of leaders to, um, to perform at such a high level in competition and to help them really you know, I'm the rah-rah team. Not only was I a judge advocate, the <laughs> one who led all the competitions in the state of of Tennessee, but I also was the one who inspired them to, to do their best, to think critically, to do more than what they thought they could do. And so the skills that Alex and I have learned, I incorporate that as well into them. And one of the things that I noted, and we're going to be talking about a little bit more about neurodiversity is that many of these children, many of them have ADHD. They have, they're they're autistic. And to help them learn how to present themselves in a logical way and to build a robot, build a robot, talk about the robot, tell about the whole story of all the successes and the failures on a world stage was phenomenal. And that was why I won the award because I was that person who stood in the gap between what they said they couldn't do to now be able to say they can. Well, it's such a beautiful award, Barbara. And I know when you first received that award, just I have also coached a lot in STEM as well. And so I know when Barbara and I first met, it was like, you know, that thing that kind of we had in common, you know, me with my background in education, educational technology. And interesting enough, Barbara, as you said that, that's exactly what came to mind was like, when we look at a lot of the children, you know, the boys and the girls that joined a lot of the STEM activities and robotics, they did have that gift. And it's because of that gift that they were so strong in being able to think critically about how to build the robot, right? Because it's it's complex thinking to be able to build the robot and go through those those the challenges and and the you know, I'm just thinking like the setup and and also to be able to present it. I remember leaning into that. So I know how 
important and it's just so beautiful Barbara for the stand that you take for these children and the stand that you take as a woman in STEM right like I've also got to work with a lot of women in STEM and entrepreneurship and innovation and so that's why when Barbara and I were talking I was so excited to bring Barbara onto this podcast to dive into some of this because as I said earlier, whether or not it's this is you, you lead those in your team, or maybe you have children. What we want to dive in today is to really empower you in you know the decisions you make, the actions you take to create the results that you get to create, looking at the neuroscience of it and really helping to erase that stigma and so that you you have this confidence as you're, you know. Being, I mean, you're really being you as you as you have confidence in your leadership in what you do, and yeah. So let's dive in, Barbara. I'm just I'm so excited to unpack a little bit of this. So, could you start off? I'd really love to hear from your perspective. Like, how do you define neurodiversity? Because I know for myself, it seems to be more of a term that's been used a lot more lately, whereas previously neurodiversity was really more, you know, your ADD, ADHD, autism, dyslexia. You know, I heard, um, I interviewed a leader a few months ago, also mentioned how even anxiety, like someone who's very anxious can play a, a role into that as well. So I'd love to hear from your perspective, how do you define that so that the listener can connect with that and just really understand when we're talking about neurodiversity, what exactly we're speaking into? Right. Well, and, and what I want to, I want to first say is that People who have ADD or autism or they're dyslexic, that is a gift. But the, we have the world leaders as well who mm-hmm. have this, which yeah. means that they're not only once gifted, it's more like two or three times because they might be in leadership. They might be leading teams. They might be, there's, there's a whole variety. And unfortunately, in our society, We have a stigma about somebody who learns differently, Mm -hmm. right? And so neurodivergence to me is, if you just look at it on a very granular level first, is that it means that there's something different about the brain from the norm. Now, does different necessarily mean that it's bad? Well, if you look at schools, right? Okay. For the oh, we didn't tell anybody. Oh, he has ADHD or he has ADD. Oh, that's a problem child. And so we stigmatized it as educators initially because oh, we didn't know how to handle that, right? When really it's just a difference in how the brain processes things. They are they learn differently. But how many people learn the same anyway? Right there. If you're in education, there's nobody that learns the same. We're all different. So we happen to know a lot more because we we understand the brain science of these particular. I'm not going to even call them a disease. Right. Mm -hmm. They call it diseases. Mm -hmm. If you're going to the medical uh, institution, I don't even call it a disease. It's just an opportunity for these children and adults to think differently. And if you think about what Einstein said, the way to solve the problem is not the way that you got into the problem. You have to have a different way of thinking to solve the problem. And so thank goodness for people who think differently. Yeah. You know, they are able to think. And we as a, as a society, we are only capitalizing on the ones who may not have the mental capacity to think in the way that many people think, right? Mm -hmm. And so, yes, there are some people who, with these things, with what they would call disease, don't think on a level that we're talking about. There's many people who have ADHD. There's many people who have autism and dyslexia. That does not make them less. It actually makes them more. Not at all. My experience as a woman with being neurodiverse <laughs> with the aut not the autism, my son has the autism, but my daughter and I both have the ADHD component, ADD, ADHD. And it just meant we thought differently. It just me- meant that we need to engage a slightly different way. And when you know that, then everything becomes possible and you can live in possibility. 
And I think that that's the misnomer that mm-hmm. the, the stigma of our society right now is that, oh, somebody with ADHD or autism, they're always going to need someone to take care of them. They're, they're deficient. They're, they're, they're less than, right? Mm-hmm. And that's further from the truth. Yeah. That's further from the truth. So why not embrace learning and thinking differently? Because they are able And that's what we miss as a society. So my definition is very different from others in that I don't see it as a, as something where you have to say, oh, we have to do something special Mm -hmm. for that person because they have ADHD. There's a lot of people who think differently, but they don't know that they're ADHD. There's a lot of people who have ADHD who think normally, right? According Mm -hmm. to what normal is. And so I think that the the definitions need to be thrown out. I think it's all about (laughs) really and truly, I think that it's, as you said at the very beginning, diversity to me is meant to be embraced. Mm -hmm. We all come from different family of origins, and then we have our families of choice, right? And because we all grew up with our family of origins, that creates more of the diversity in how we think than the ADHD does. Yeah. However, if you're growing up in a family that says, oh my gosh, you're, you've got ADHD and what happens with that child is they begin to think that they're less than, oh, I can't sit at school. I have ADHD. You know, I'm the label becomes I'm bad. And so they grow up thinking they're bad or they're wrong, always wrong. They're bad and they can't do something. They can't learn something that's complex. And both you and I know that's absolutely not true. Well, as you're speaking, it, it goes back to like one of the things like the, the one of the first steps, right, is the identity, right? So how, mm-hmm. yes, you can identify as being neurodivergent, but what is definition, right? How do you define how you see that, right? The society a lot of times has really put it put up as being special or a different and effort, right? Like there's, there's energy around this and not usually very positive energy. So of course, if a child is growing up and we know the importance that, that between zero and seven plays on what that looks like impacts now how you go into being a teenager and oh my goodness, right. Being a teenager in school and already you have all the hormones and everything. And now you, you know, maybe you go off to university and then you go into the workforce and then you're kind of grown up in the box system and where it's, you know, it's supposed to be this way. And I know Barbara, before we recorded, we kind of spoke into that, right? Like the way that the education system was built was very much, right? You go to school, you go to college, you go get a job, right? Box, 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 like, and the reality is that someone who has got the gift of being neurodivergent, they are creative, right? They are busting outside of the box, right? They thrive outside of the box. And so I, you know, I, t- I promised Barbara, I wasn't going to go too much into this, the education system, but my, my previous job was to work with educators to help differentiate learning and whatever was applied for those that were neurodivergent, it works for every single body in the classroom. And so once you're able to tap into your gifts, and define it differently of how you see yourself as someone who is very creative, as someone who thinks like this, who's someone with that potential, that is going to definitely impact very differently on the decisions you make, your thoughts and your beliefs and your actions and results that you create. And so I love one, Barbara, how you're saying is like throw the definition out the door and really just connect with you as an individual of how you thrive and getting to know how you do learn best, right? Like going back to the learning piece, right? There's There's a variety of different ways that somebody can learn. And so knowing that in the classroom, it's really looking at a situation and how do I get to learn about whatever I get to learn about given my my gifts and having work with especially a lot of neurodivergent children, like those who are neurodiverse if they move, they'll actually retain more information. So it's like contradicting because we're like, oh, I want you to sit down in class. But in fact, if they can move, they will be able to, retain their focus, be able to hear more information and they're, it's going to last a lot longer. And so this is, this is just for those of you are listening, I really want to invite you to just kind of think about yourself. Like, how do you learn best looking at those around you and 
sort of almost challenge the status quo of how you're doing things, right? Sometimes I ask people to sit down in a long board meeting like that just, we're not like, how do we set you? How do you set your teams? How do you set the people in your life up for success? Whether or whether or not they're neurodivergent, everything that, and we can dive in some more tactical things, Barbara, everything we touch on is really going to benefit every single person because we're tapping into the brain science of success and how we use the brain science of success to then create those results. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. No, I mean, I was going to talk about some of my girls in STEM. And it's so funny because when you were saying, you know, they're creative and they solve this and they solve that, and they're, they're the ones who will say, well, what box? I'm not going to go into a box. <laughs> Throw out that box. I'm creating, yes. I'm yes. creating all of this because I don't, I don't even see the box because yeah. I, I don't belong in it. Right. Yeah. And it's like, it's only because of saying, Hey, we are all blessed with gifts and talents that we get to use and creativity, you know, particularly for women in, in business, women in STEM, that creativity, that innovation part requires different thinking. And so, as we said, you know, the what got you into a particular situation isn't what's going to lead you out. So why put yourself in the box? Yeah. You know, why put yourself there? Why not say, okay, let's, you, you know, as well as I do, when we're looking at goals, if we put ourselves in the bo- in the box, then we're not really going after any kind of goal. A 10% increase in, in a measure is nothing. It's really, it cause if you really want to get to the goals that you want in your life, they've got to be outside that box. They've got to be big and audacious, something that actually scares you, Yeah. but it's something all the same you want to do. You're inviting yourself to do, right? And so with neurodiverse, the kids have been put in this box, right? Mm-hmm. From a very early age. And they realize, oh, I'm never going to mount anything because I have ADHD. And it's like, I want to crush that box. I want to work with teachers and educate, you know, other kinds of educators and parents, parent advocates to let them know just because of that stigma, we get to redefine what that is. Yeah. So that we have a society who can solve the world's problems. And, you know, that's my goal is to to help people solve better problems. And it starts with understanding there's a problem with where we are. And that we don't, we get to ditch the box yeah. and we get to ditch the labels, right? Yep. Yep. So that we can create the dream or the world that we see in front of us. And that dream should not go in our pillow. That <laughs> Yes, there. exactly. So right? before, before we dive into some more like tactical things of like, now, how do we create that? I just want to invite the listener to celebrate <laughs> because we know yes. right? the power of celebration. Definitely, definitely, and- definitely. definitely. So I want to, I want the listener to celebrate, celebrate one that you're listening to this, this episode, celebrate two, if you're a neurodivergent, the gifts that you bring to the table, the gifts that make you unique, the gifts, like if you're listening to this podcast, you are a high achiever, you are in some sort of leadership role, right? Whether you're an entrepreneur, you're, you're a powerhouse woman in corporate leadership, you're a leader. You know, Barbara and I said this before. I'm like, who we're speaking to today is a powerhouse leader, female leader. And that's who you are. And so celebrate what, how you got to where you are, because very most likely it's because of the gifts of the being neurodivergent that got you where you are today. And even if you're not, everything that we're going to dive into today is still going to support you in becoming, you know what I love to say, unleashed and unstoppable in everything that you do. So just celebrate because we know the power of celebration when it comes to our productivity, our results and what we get to create and high achievers, right? Because if you're listening, you're probably also a high achiever. High achievers are very much go, 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 go. So we get to really lean into acknowledging you, you getting to acknowledge yourself and celebrating who you are, the things that you've already created, the obstacles you've overcome. And lean into what you get to create further in the next chapter after you listen to this this podcast. So I and I wanted to, to I just I had some notes that um, 
Of course they did. Real quick, right? That I want to review real quick because when we think about ourselves and our children, how important it is to really identify our strengths, mm-hmm. right? You can be neurodivergent and you can be a leader. You can be neurodivergent and creative. You can be neurodivergent and a team builder. You can be neurodivergent and get the most bold, audacious goals that you've ever dreamed of, right? Yeah. And so it's really build on your strengths, Figure out what your strength is and build from there. I mean, that's number one. Number two is we get to change the narrative. If you're neurodivergent and you're a leader and you feel crushed by all the labels that are out there, you get to change that narrative. You get to redefine who you are and who's your, you know, who, who do you get to be? I mean, we talk a lot about in our community about being our version 2.0. Yeah. It's like, who do you get to be in order to create the goals that you see in your brain, in your mind, because you've got to create it twice in your brain first, and then it happens in reality. But if you don't believe in you and you don't have the faith here that you can do it, then it's not going to work. It's all brain science, incidentally. And so my brain being neurodivergent is no different from somebody who isn't neurodivergent. And so to give you hope is that we all get to change the narrative, to make it a positive one, to make it the one where, you know, if we're all leaders, we have to lead ourselves first. Yeah. We get to change the narrative for who we are first to help the others that are in our lives, to help the others that in in the in the in the in what in who we lead, that's what's important. We get to change that. We're the change makers, right? We sure are. We, we definitely sure are. are. Yeah. And by being the change maker, we get to create the positive narrative for ourselves first, lead ourselves, and then we can change the narrative for the other people that are important in our jobs, in our lives, in our businesses, and in the things that we consider important. So you know, we're all about the call to actions, right? Like action steps to take. So first off, I want to invite the listener, like identify your strengths, just like Barbara invited you to do. And I'm going to invite you to also identify the strengths of those that you lead in your children. I really Mm want to lead into that conversation. As Barbara said, like we get to lead by example, like start change the conversation in your world, change the conversation and lean into celebrating everybody's strengths, celebrating what makes them unique, what you know, I, I've so aware because of being a neuro coach, like the language I use with my daughters in really celebrating, you know, their, their strength. Like my daughter's very strong. I'm like, oh, you know, you're, you're very, you know, you're very strong or, you know, you ask really great questions, like really celebrating and leading into the, the strengths of my daughters so that we can start to develop those neural pathways in our young children and then break the patterns and the thought patterns and the neural pathways that have been created that aren't negative. We want to replace them with a positive. So leaning into that, celebrating your strengths and celebrating the strengths of those around you, I think is really powerful, especially if you were to start a meeting, right? And everyone start, you invite everyone, you know, share one thing that makes you really strong in what you do. And in, in the neural path, sorry, not the neural pathways, the neural chemical release that'll happen in that moment, then also fuels productivity, which ultimately, right? Especially if you're a leader leading a team, of course, you want your teams to be more productive, but these are types of things that are going to help in an easier way without having to do more just because of how they're feeling and what they're experiencing in their brain to then to take action. Well, take that a level higher, Alex, is that when you start with what's your win for the day, what's your win for the week, you all of a sudden are on a different plane, so mm-hmm. to speak, of how you're going to actually solve a problem. When mm. we are just in that survival mode, we're yeah. angry, we're we're upset, and we're bringing that kind of energy in there, our brain is geared to look for, we're not even thinking at that point in time. So we're geared to looking at things in the past. We're not innovating new strategies or new methods or new ideas. We can't brainstorm. All we're going to see is what's in the past. The minute we put in that focus of, celebrating where we have come from and we recognize, wow, 
you know, like with your daughters, you're strong, you ask great questions, and then you start doing the problem solving and the innovation work and what's next, you're automatically solving from your 2.0, that person that's in your vision of what you want to create. And so that's all neuroscience. That has nothing to do with magic or manifestation. <laughs> I am not, I'm, I'm, I'm not a woo-woo girl. Sorry. I'm a science girl. And the science behind us is that the brain doesn't know the difference really between something you visualize in the future with full detail because you're actually creating a neural pathway to it by creating your vision and your mission. Um, and this way, you know, the language of the brain is certainty, mm -hmm. right? What keeps us from getting to our goals is because it's uncertain because we've never been there before. But when we actually step into our vision and why we're doing it and going deep with that, we actually start creating the neurochemicals and the neural pathway to actually get there. And then it's actually certain. And then the brain goes, Oh, I've kind of been here before. It's okay. I can, I can do this. Right. Before we wrap up, Barbara, because I know that we're, we are coming at the time here. There's one other thing that comes up to mind that I'd love for you to kind of dive into a little bit focus, right? Because focus mm -hmm. seems to be a common thing, right? Because when you mm -hmm. are so creative and you have all these ideas, the ability to focus on the task at hand to then get into action there. So what can you unpack there a little bit around focus so that the listener can, can get grounded in the focus and then take action in their 2.0 and then create those results from that place of vision? Well, you know, as well as I do, is that when the brain starts spinning with all these ideas, then, then that causes the brain to stop. And what we don't want to do is lose all those great, great ideas. They might be crazy ideas. They might be, you know, really silly ideas. Uh, I call them crazy. But, you know, sometimes when you build on those ideas that you can create something even better. Mm -hmm. And so the first thing I would say just to stop and so you can start focusing again is actually start writing down all the things that are keeping you out of focus. Because what happens next is the brain actually stops because it's like, oh my gosh, I have all these things to do. And then, then, then there's the overwhelm. Oh, I have to be perfect. Oh my gosh, I have to procrastinate because there's too much there, right? So it's like, you know, this is the crazy brain that we live in <laughs> is that, we as high performers always, I'm going to say always have, I always have a ton of things that are spinning in my head. And if I don't write them down, then I won't focus on what it is that I really want to do to move my needle forward every single day. Brain dump. That's what I'm always about the brain dumps, brain right? Dump. Brain yep. dumps, brain, brain dumps, dump. brain, brain dumps. Dump. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, I think I have, I have a note section on my phone that's called brain dump. So just everything that comes there and just brain dump it, brain dump it, brain dump it. So exactly. So that would be the first step. The second step is, is that we are so good at a lot of times because we're visionaries, right? Mm -hmm. So as a visionary, we have these great big goals that we have and we get overwhelmed because all of a sudden we realize, oh, I don't know if I can actually reach them. And so what that, again, creates is a different kind of thinking is that we get to break that down into ridiculously small steps. I call them micro steps because when I allow my brain to do a too big of a step, then my brain shuts down. So in order for my brain not to shut down, I will do baby step by baby step. I call them micro steps. If my baby step is too big, I break it down even further. So I know Alex and you and I were talking before this started. And you know, one of the strategies is to put yourself on a timer and do a 30 minute block for that one thing. What we want to do is actually break it down. And what I find really helpful for me is that I, you know, when I do the 30 minutes, there's some days, yeah, that's fine. But there's many days where I need to break that time down even more because my brain is just in a state. And we all find that because of life. And, and you know what I've gone through is that there's sometimes even if I wanted to do a whole 30 minutes, I can't 
I can't make myself do it, but I want to make sure that I'm still putting myself in success by moving the needle. Mm -hmm. So I'll even break it down to 15 minute slots. I'll break it down to 10 minute. And there's times where I'll just do three 15 minute slots for three different things that I know I can do quick. And then it's like, I celebrate. And then I ask myself, could I do another five minutes? Mm. And then what happens is that, oh, then I can do another 10. And then I ask myself again, could I do another 10 minutes? And maybe that on that particular sticky, oh, I'm doing 30 minutes. And so it's always an ask, can I do a little bit more? And when my brain says, "Mm, I'm done, I don't worry about it. So often people get into programs, they're telling you how to break this down and Mm -hmm. then you need to work an hour on this and an hour on that and an hour on that. And with someone with ADHD, working that hour is not productive because it's like I'm doing it for five minutes and then it's like my mind is wandering, right? And it's like, well, okay, if I hone myself in and really make that time count, even if it's for five minutes, I know I've moved the needle. Mm-hmm. That is more important in your brain than anything else. Well, what's coming? So there's because I'm hearing you say two things. So I want to just like re revisit what you've said. So on one hand, there is really breaking down the task that you're working on into, and I will say I'm a favorable to 50 minutes. I just find the 50 minutes is, is easier. So like, just ask myself like, what is something that can get done in 50 minutes or less, and being clear on that. And that's if. And that's like, that piece is great when you're like, okay, I know exactly what to do. Now, if there's something that you're noticing some resistance around, it's just committing, like, can you, can you do that for five minutes and then increasing, can you do it to 10, can you do it to 15? So I think it's really tackling, like there's things that we love to do and just, you know, getting to it. And then there's other things that we may find more challenging or our brain is trying to keep us safe. So we might feel something around that. And so just committing to doing a couple of minutes and then you'll see as you get going, because part of it's just getting going, right? Like we've heard, exactly. uh, there's like eating the frog first, right? So just getting going to, to get into motion. Cause once you're in motion, you can, you can keep going. So I wanted to just cl- clarify that there's like kind of two different angles there. And what I wanted to share for myself, what's really, really helpful is that this is my sister's, my accountability buddy. And in the morning, when I'm setting the intention for the day, I will share with her. So today I'm committed to doing and I'll, or creating these three things. And I really lean into, right? Like what is something that can be done in 50 minutes or less? And what are the, like the priorities? What are the most important things? And of course, because we all to do more i'll oftentimes break it up as like these are like the the priority that the three the, the three main things and then i put a little line of like and and if there's time or whatever happens like here these are like the next things that i could work on but as long as i'm moving the needle forward on those three things and i get you know i get friends all the time we get clients all the time they're like okay this is what i'm committed to creating and i don't know about you barbara but i always notice that the automatic is to declare a big project and so, especially if you're neurodiverse, right? We, you know, because we do a lot of it, we keep it in our head, which is why we're like brain dump, brain dump, brain dump. Organize your tasks on the calendar, on sticky notes, somewhere that you can actually physically manipulate so that you are connecting with what gets to be done. And practice this, the, this, the muscle of really breaking down the tasks because the number one thing that's going to lead to overwhelm is when you look at your to-do list and you've got three projects that could probably take you three days or three hours or whatever it may be. They're not necessarily 50 minute tasks. And it's so much easier to get into action when you look at something that is a 50 minute task or less, because you, you know exactly what you're getting, you're getting to. And then that timer really helps get it out of the perfectionism and even the procrastination because you're like, okay, this is what I'm committed to the 50 minutes. And after that 50 minutes done is better than perfect. And that has been a motto that has helped me so much. The last last thing I wanted to lean into what supports me is music. So there is a ton of different brain productivity boost playlists out there, but I do find that that's really helpful to get into that sort of focus and that flow is to put on some of that brain music because I'm tapping into 
my brain productivity to get into that. And it just, it's almost, it's like a ritual, right? And it's like, okay, I'm committed to sitting here for whatever it is, 15, 30, 45 minutes. And that music really, really helps me. In fact, I've even caught myself having my, like my headphones on my ears with no music, but just the fact of like taking those headphones and putting it, it like creates this zone of, of focus. So I know that those are things that have really, really helped me out. But really declaring, like declaring what is you're going to work on makes a massive difference versus sitting there and be like, okay, what am I going to work on now? Especially when you have young children <laughs> or especially if like you're on, and you're constantly getting interrupted, right? Like people are coming to you or whatever. Like when you're clear on those three things, you always have something to go back to and just having something to support you and getting grounded and what you're taking action on. I just, I find that those make such a massive difference. And um, that time, right? Time to set yourself up for success in declaring what those things are. So I know exactly. I would see my brain's kind of gone a little bit all over there, but no, no, no. that's everything that's come to that me, was Barbara. Perfect. That was absolutely perfect because go back to the brain science, okay, for a minute, is that when we are doing complex things, mm -hmm. the neurodivergent brain actually slows down. And so we really get to be mindful that if something is really complex, it might take us a little bit longer. I know that it gets frustrating at times. It's like, ah, oh, I really thought that this would be a 15 minute mm -hmm. thing and it took 45 minutes. And it's like, and I have all these other things I need to do. Well, guess what? If it took 45 minutes, that's the three things that you get done for the day, yeah. right? Yeah. What the brain doesn't like is the uncertainty of the task. And that's when it starts getting frustrated. That's when it wants to shut down. That's when the lack of focus comes in because the brain will literally take you out if it's not certain. And so when you actually take the time to make the baby steps, the micro steps, the, the three things, it'll take you 15 minutes or 10 minutes or five minutes. The brain loves that because it says, here's the path. I go from A to B. Okay, good. We got that done. I can do the next. I go from B to C. Okay, got that done. I can go to the next. The brain is so happy because it's certain of mm -hmm. what's going to happen next. And so then it, it allows you to actually do more. And the idea, oh, I love the music idea. I use that as well. I use a timer as well. And you know as well as I do, it's better done than perfect. Mm -hmm. Always do it messy because I know from me, I would always work for a hundred percent. It's gotta be perfect. So the idea that now it's like, you know, if it's 60, 70% perfect done, I can still get it out there because I know I can still tweak whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And so it's better to get it out there than to not better to be done than, than to, to feel like, ah. Oh, it's not good enough yet because that's just a brain break. Mm -hmm. That's just, that's just something that Pat followed us from not even our own brain, but from somebody else that we're not good enough. The thing is, is that we are more than enough. We are good enough to do whatever, even if we're neurodiverse, we have the ideas and it's time to get those executed and having a buddy with you, someone to help you keep accountable, who has the highest good for you, like your sister, that's pure gold. That's and pure it, gold. And it's supportive, right? Because then you're, you're like, it's not just a declaration out there to the world, but you are declaring it to somebody. So there becomes that declaration, which also supports like with the reticular activating system, right? So you're making things right. out there, the importance of like sharing right. your vision, sharing what's important right. to you a bit of the accountability and you know what? I have something to go back to. Well, the amount of yeah. times I'll go back to my text message, like, okay, so what was the thing I said? And then what was the next thing? Cause I, I, I think through it, right. It's, it's kind right. of like a bit of a brain dump of like, okay, this is, these are the things. And then I organize it based on sort of as Barbara, I didn't think this actually before we were recording, we were talking about a lot of times, you know, we have times in the day that we notice that we're more, we're more productive or we're able to be more focused, or there's just certain times of day that just tend to work for us. And so thinking through like when you're going to work on certain things, right? If, if you're someone who gets tired by the end of the day, you're not, you're not going to want to schedule something that's going to require deep, heavy focus, creativity, and concentration. At the end of the day, you want to start that at the, at the beginning of the day. Now there's some people out there that they are night owls and like their golden hour is, you know, in the evening. So it's, 
this is where, you know, we said at the beginning, you get to look at yourself. What are your strengths? And how do you set yourself up for success? There's one other thing, Barbara, that I've actually done recently too, that I've noticed has really supported me with setting myself up for success is building out SOPs. So standard operating systems for everything, <laughs> like things that are even related to just the family, like how to sit down and be effective with uh, meal planning, like literally I've written this out because then it just takes away into the guesswork. And it's like, okay, this is the task that I get to complete. Here's my SOP. And, you know, I just, I just work through it and oh my goodness, you, you know, it's like you work through it, but then you get it down to a science and then something that may have taken you, who knows, like maybe an hour to do is like got down to 15 minutes because you systemized it and then you'll be able to work through it. And right. I will notice that that's what I'm noticing. Like things that I sort of repeated type of tasks that I'm always noticing, like, oh man, it takes me a while to get into it. Right. Cause sometimes that's part of it. It's like, oh, I did get into it. And right. so I started to build out these SOPs and it's really made such a game changer and it's really provided some structure and some guidance, you know, as you were leading to before Barbara, and that's really supported in terms of the focus and to be able to get through. And what's so amazing Cause as I said before, like if you're someone that experiences a lot of interruption, you can put like a highlighter, you can indicate on your list where you, where you finished. So when you come back to it, you know exactly where to get started because there is, um, there, you know, I heard someone share with me before and I wasn't surprised by the statistic, but it can sometimes take you up to 15 minutes just to get focus on the work that you're doing. So imagine that if it takes you that much time to get yourself sorted or organized or whatever it may be, you're just, you're gaining back now that 50 minutes when you're setting yourself up for success in, in what you're working on and, and um, yeah, and, and, and the task that, you, that you're working on. So I just, I've noticed that personally myself such been such a game changer. So I kind of wanted to share that as a I guess kind of a bonus tip here. As you were talking, I was thinking about that. I was like, oh yeah, I really start to do this everywhere. Um, and it's right. really made a big difference, especially my focus and productivity. And I'm not feeling, it really has removed any frustration because I'm not feeling like, oh my goodness, where was I? That that sense of loss, as you said before, the brain loves certainty. As soon as mm -hmm. I sit back down, I know exactly where I was and I can just continue to go. So yeah, I wanted to yeah, share that. Is that is so cool. That is beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Well, it, exactly. So think about when um, you're pulled off a task, right? Mm -hmm. the, it's that uncertainty element again, because it's like, oh, you know, and then you come back, it's like, well, where was I kind of thing? And so, yeah, it takes a lot of energy. Think mm -hmm. about this is that when you stop momentum, right? You're, you're doing your thing, you're doing your thing, you, you're, you're in your zone, and then somebody interrupts you, it takes away the momentum. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that energy that it takes to get back into it. So it's really, I mean, it's vital to know, are you a morning person? Are you an evening person? I love that because you have different energies throughout the day. Like I know I'll write in the morning, but I'll do my other tasks that don't require the brain power, but I still want to get them done. I'll do those things in the afternoon, you know, such as working with my clients. Right. But I'll do the creative things in the morning where the other things I don't need that same kind of brain power. I'll do in a different time. And so it's really understanding who you are and how do you tap into the best of you? Write it down. When are you good at doing this? When are you not so good at doing this? You know, it's, it's all about who you are and how can you maximize the time that you have to do the things you want and knowing it doesn't have to be a hundred percent, you get to experiment. Mm -hmm. And we are so afraid of making a mistake. We're so afraid of failure. And, you know, I think about, you know, all the people that I work with and they're so afraid that, oh my gosh, if I get it wrong, then I am a failure. And as a high achiever, we don't ever want to get anything wrong. But my invitation to people is to, you know, give yourself a lot of grace and ease and remember how does the brain learn? Mm -hmm. Brain doesn't learn by getting it right. The brain learns first by getting it wrong and then be able to learn from it so that it can move forward. And so that's the same thing that we're talking about is that we have taken a whole part of the society, people who are neurodivergent and told them that they're wrong. So guess what the brain says? It's not going to learn. So they don't feel like they can get the higher things 
truth of the matter is we're all overcomers and we have figured it out. Everything is figure outable. Exactly. Exactly. But I love that, that what you shared there, Barbara, like you can overcome anything. And so leaning into that, like that, even if that's sort of a mantra or something, right. That, you know, I, I can overcome anything and everything is figure outable, like leaning into that, right. That is better mm-hmm. than perfect. Taking mm-hmm. messy action, all of those things. I know for myself, once I started to apply some of these little sayings, it really made a massive difference in being able to get into action. Right. Now we know about the brain. We know about the beliefs because of the work that Barbara and I do. It was fascinating to become aware of some of these thoughts and beliefs that were standing in my way. Like I didn't want my, I didn't want to let people down. I didn't want people to think I didn't know what I was doing, like all of these things. And a lot of it is based looking at society. And so my invitation for the listener too, is just become aware of that. Pay attention to what does come up for you. You know, when you put the timer on and it's 15 minutes and maybe it's not perfect, lean into what's coming up. What are some of the stories and beliefs around that? And then of course we invite you to, to do, to do the work, right. To to do some of this work, to be able to unpack some of that, because especially leaning into burnout, right. It's the thoughts that, that lead to that and contribute to that when we are high achievers and we're trying to use our grit and resilience to see, to overcome all the thoughts that are, are holding us back. And we know that, you know, unfortunately, a lot of our thoughts are very negative, right? Up to 90, 95% of our thoughts can be quite negative. And so lean into the positives, lean into your strengths and gifts, as Barbara said earlier, write your vision down, get clear with your vision, share your vision with the people that are in your life that you love, you know, send us messages to share the vision, what you're, you're committed to creating, do the brain dumps, right? Get things out of your head and onto paper so that you can visually see it and then break those tasks down so that you can get in to actionable steps and look at yourself, look at how you operate best in the day, even in the week, right? Another kind of productivity hack is, is not necessarily um, there's the daytime, but there's also looking at your, your days of the week, right? If you certain notice that certain days of the week, you're more creative. Like for me, Tuesday mornings seem to be days that I'm really, really creative. And this is through the experiment of doing different things, trying different things at different times of day, at different days of the week to tap into, okay, where do I find that I'm most creative? So what Barbara and I stand for is really celebrating you, celebrating your gifts, celebrating your strengths and leaning into setting how you get to set yourself up for success and to celebrate and lean into that. And then the last thing I want to say is take a stand for you. You know, if you're in a situation and you notice that this is how you work best, communicate that. Enroll those in, around you to support you so that you can optimally perform at your best. If you're keeping it to yourself. And then people are asking you to do certain things that are not in alignment with how you perform best, how you work best, then you're going to experience, you know, this frustration and it experiences this internal battle, right? So share that, celebrate and really own your gifts, own your, your creativity, own your talents, your strengths, and really use that to fuel what you get to create and lean into that and understand that it's a journey. It's a process and failing, right? is the first attempt in learning. And so embrace that, celebrate that. Barbara, is there anything else you want to add up, add in today before we wrap up? I was just thinking about, you know, celebrating and giving yourself the gift, Mm. slowing down in order to speed up. Mm -hmm. Okay. When as a neurodivergent person, when you have everything coming all the time, there, your brain actually needs some place to rest and it needs that time in order to come back so that it's creative. So if you notice that your focus is waning and you're not able to get back on track, that might be an indication you need to give yourself a little bit of, little bit of time and space to just rest so that you can go like however you want to go in creating your goals and dreams right? Because it's that gift of pause, that gift of the space, like during the day, I know that I'm not creative 24 seven, but if I give myself a gift of space on a daily basis, 
I know that that creativity comes back. That's not something to be uh, shying away from. It's something to realize the human body's not meant to be running 24 seven. Power of the pause, right? Really? Power of the pause. You bet. It really fuels your productivity and that, that place of silence, because that's where your brain is going to be creative. Um, Mm -hmm. Just leaning on ever notice and you're in the shower and you get all of these ideas, or maybe you're Mm -hmm. out in nature to get all these ideas. There's a reason for that. That's, that's also neuroscience, right? Because that's That's the pause, right? Because you're there doing something else. And so gift yourselves that maybe it might be an extra long shower or a walk in nature. Just find ways throughout the day that you can create that and gift yourselves that so that you can really truly tap into the gift of creativity and your focus and just to connect with what it is that you're getting to create and drop into your heart, right? Mm -hmm. So that it's not always about the doing. You guys hear us often talk about the being, but that you are coming from a place of heart. You are grounded in what you're creating and everything really will flow. But it really does start with you, as you shared, Barbara, and your strengths and your gifts and your celebration. And and guess what happens after that? You become that leader that you want to be because you have done the work and you have dropped into your heart and you lead with compassion. You lead with empathy. And not only are you leading yourself, but you're leading the other people in your life. Beautiful reminder, Barbara. As you said that, I'm like looking at my bold, right? Being an outrageously loving and daring leader. So that's that's what that is. So Barbara, I want to thank you so much for being here today. I always love jamming with you, having conversations around our diversity, around STEM, around leadership, high performance, right? We get it. We are just like you, listener. And so we are so we're extremely passionate about this. This is why Carol and I have put this podcast together. And we're just so honored to have a colleague of ours, Barbara, to jump on with us today to dive into this further and unpack, especially with the science of it and with Barbara's background in chemistry. Before we wrap up, Barbara, do you have, um, yeah, do you want to share a little bit like how the audience could connect with you, how they could learn more from you? So they can connect with me uh, at Barbara at coachbarbaraharrington.com. They can also find me on LinkedIn. And I know that'll be in the show notes. I'm getting ready. If you're a STEMinista and you are looking for a network of people that are going to help you, you know, move forward in, in your career, or you want to help others move forward in their careers, I'm starting uh, something very special in my heart. And that's a network for STEM and STEAM women. It's the <laughs> it's the why that makes you cry, right? Mm-hmm. And um, so I'm getting ready to start that. And I am. Uh, it's going to be on Facebook. It's going to be on uh, LinkedIn. Um, yeah, uh, there is a post from yesterday. So yesterday would be the uh, 29th of November, where it starts explaining some of the things that I'm getting ready to start. Uh, as a as an entrepreneur, as a as a woman's coach in STEM and STEAM, and if that's you, I would welcome you into the community. Um, a lot of cool things are going to be happening there. Beautiful, Barbara. Was that on LinkedIn? That's the best place for them to connect with LinkedIn? you on LinkedIn. Yeah, LinkedIn is a great place to find me. Awesome. So it's Barbara Link Harrington on LinkedIn. You'll be able to find me. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for tuning in today. We're learning all about neurodiversity and really, like we said, busting the myth, busting the stigma around this and just really embracing who you are, your loved ones in your life, their gifts, and just taking a stand for the greatness that gets to be, that comes from those that have been gifted with neurodiversity. So thank you so much, listener. Thank you, Barbara. And we will see you next week. Bye. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Unleashed Unstoppable podcast with your hosts, Alexander Carter and Cal Register. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, please share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave a rating and review and subscribe. That's all for this episode, Wildly Ambitious Leaders. See you next week.